Oh, good morning. How are you today? Good. That was hearty. I like that. Everybody's doing well. So glad you're here. I'm so glad we're able to gather together and worship Christ together, especially if you're new or you're new-ish here. Welcome in. I'm so glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us, welcome. If you're a first-time guest, what a brave thing to do is to come in here today. We're so glad that you're here. And if you are a first-time guest, we do have a gift for you out in the foyer. There's a, there's a first-time guest table. Just visit that today. Uh, grab something from that table. Uh, it's a book. It's got to be a book. I mean, I guess you can take the book holders. That could be a gift to you today as well if you want to do that. Uh, if you are a guest, we do have a guest information card. You can fill that out. That would help us greatly to connect with you. Uh, if you're a guest and you have children who go to children's church, that's pre-K through first grade, uh, they leave at a very definite time during the service. You'll see that, uh, but there are in the pew racks in front of you uh, name tags. You, part of that goes on your child, part of that you keep, so you guys can reconnect on the second floor after the service is over. So today is, is no accident. Uh, the Lord is calling each of us, uh, if we have ears to hear and eyes to see, uh, he's calling us to himself, that we find in Jesus, when we come to him, we find wholeness and tranquility, and rest, and peace. So, for all who are weary and need rest, for all who mourn and long for comfort, for all who fail and desire strength, and for all who sin and need a Savior, I'm able to say welcome to you this morning. This church opens wide its doors to you because the Lord Jesus Christ has opened wide his arms to you. Welcome to worship this morning. So as we gather, our, our call to worship will be uh, from some words of Jesus. I invite you to stand with me. Uh, this is a responsive reading. You'll find it on the screen. I'll read the portions printed in white. If you'll respond with the portions printed in yellow, and this will be our call to worship. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus also says, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us worship God. As we understand our welcome to come from Jesus Christ, you have this opportunity in the moments ahead uh, to greet those around you, to pass that welcome on to one another. And more specifically, we call this passing the peace, that we're able to pass the peace of Christ to one another. Let's take a few moments and welcome those around us. Well, good morning, folks. As you make your way back to your seat, go ahead and be seated, actually. <clears throat> the opening selection, the choir will introduce. It uses a familiar tune, has a text uh, that points us toward missions and those causes. The choir will sing through a stanza and then a chorus that will repeat itself. And at the end of that, I'll ask that you all sing with us. But for now, I'll remain seated 
and uh, I'll turn to you, and we can sing that chorus together when we get there. Good morning, friends. How are we this morning? Good. That's great. So last week, we began talking about prayer, and we're going to continue talking about that this week. Last year, we, not last year, last week, we looked at a very famous prayer Jesus said in the New Testament. Does anyone remember what that prayer was called? Just say it out loud. The Lord's Prayer. That's right. And this week, we're going to look at it, and we're going to break it down and look at what Jesus meant and how we can use the words that Jesus spoke as he taught his disciples how to pray and how we can use that in our own lives. But before we do that, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer again. So if you know it, say it. And if you don't know it, just listen, and I promise by the end of these two weeks, you will know the Lord's Prayer. All right. Y'all ready? Our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. All right, so the first part we're going to look at is our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so Jesus starts his prayer by addressing who he's talking to, our Father in heaven. And then the second part of that is, starts off with a weird word, hallowed. That's not a word that we use often, but another word that we can use here that you hear a lot in church is holy. And holy means separate or set apart. And God's name is set apart from the rest because God is perfect in every way, and he is perfectly good all the time. And we're not because we have sin. But even though he is set apart and we're sinful, he still wants a relationship with us, and he still loves us. And we can praise God for being so loving and good even when we're not. And we can thank God for all the good things he's doing in our lives. So... I want you to think for a second, and then I want you to tell me some examples of things that you feel thankful for, some things you can praise God for. Does anyone have an example of what they're really thankful this morning? The weather. It is beautiful outside. Yeah. What is Family. 
Those are some great examples of some things we can be thankful for. Even if you didn't say some, I bet you were thankful this morning. Um, and we have a lot of reasons to praise God. And it's great to praise God, even when we're in the middle of something, we can just stop, pray, and say a quick prayer to God and tell him thank you. So the next part is, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we love God, it overflows into every other part of our lives. It's important that we think about what God is doing in the world and not just about what we want or what we need. And so can you think of some things that God, that you hope God will make right in the world? Can y'all give me some examples? What are some bad things that you see going on in the world? War. Yeah, okay. So there are a couple bad things. War is one of them. But when we pray, our prayer shouldn't just be all about ourselves. It should look outwards and to what God can make right. But it's not bad to pray for ourselves. In fact, we're going to look at that next week, that part of the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus began his prayer focusing on loving God and seeking what he wants. And we too should seek what God wants in our lives and in the world. And Jesus taught his disciples this prayer, and it's written down for us to learn too. Because remember, when we pray, we're talking with God, we're praising him, we're thanking him, and we're confessing our sins. And when we pray, we can trust that God will always hear us, even when we don't think he does. So let's pray. God, it's amazing that we can talk to you whenever we want to. Thank you for the way Jesus showed us what our prayers can look like. And Lord, we just thank you and we praise you for all the good things you're doing in the world. We ask that you would work in this world in the only way you can and help us take our time to pray throughout our day. We love you and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Bailey. So you heard the choir and then you all got to sing even on that chorus uh, for a newer song to our congregation, but the tune of the verses are familiar. We sing the church's one foundation text to that tune. So we've used that tune, but given it a very specific text. As we look toward missions, we'll have a missions week excuse me, coming up at the end of the month. Uh, and so a special service is building, and so we thought we'd bring a song that'll be a part of that service. Uh, so we ask now that you uh, sing the whole song uh, that that comes from. Please stand, let's sing. Finishing a task unfinished.
as we continue uh, in the hymnal uh, found at 400, Jesus at your holy table. The words, of course, will be here on the screen. We turn our attention, communion is a part of our service today, and so here is a chance to begin our thinking toward communion. Jesus at your holy table. Let's sing together. Adults, if you'll remain standing for just a moment, we'll have our scripture reading. Students, children, you are dismissed at this time. Adults, remain standing just for a moment. they make their way down. Our scripture reading this morning is Judges chapter 6, uh, verses 11 through 27. If you're using a pew Bible, uh, you can find that on page 239. And so if you have your copy of God's Word, that's great. Uh, if you're using a pew Bible, 239, we'll need those copies of God's Word later on in the sermon as well. It's the Word of the Lord. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, then why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the wonderful deeds that our fathers in, uh, recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and given us into the hands of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. 
And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak to me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said to him, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went to his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot. And he brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out and the tip of, the tip of his staff that was on his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, Lord God, but now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. And to this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abiezrites. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day. And he did it by night. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So each week we've been exploring stories in the Old Testament. These are accounts of people who had direct extraordinary encounters with God. We call these theophanies, that the Lord appears, God appears. The invisible God becomes visible in a manner that can be seen and heard and interacted with in a very tangible way. And so here we have the story, uh, the beginning of the Gideon story from the book of Judges. Gideon is likely a name that you're familiar with. He's perhaps one of the better known judges from the book of Judges. I, I find Gideon to be, in a lot of ways, a completely... Uh, relatable figure. Uh, Gideon, in a lot of ways, is, is very imperfect and kind of a problem, and that makes him relatable to people like us. He's a coward, right? He's weak. Uh, you read his story. He doesn't seem to quite ever just get it right. Um, and the Lord is interacting with Gideon, and it seems to be through Gideon's weakness. So we, we encounter Gideon for the first time, and he's, he's actually threshing wheat in a wine press. He's, he's hiding out uh, from, the enemies, from his enemies when the Lord appears to him. And when the Lord first appears to him and says, I'm, I'm sending you to do a task, he really presents the Lord with his anti-resume. Here's all the reasons you shouldn't hire me for this. <laughs> I have no strength. I have no reputation. I have no power. I have no money. I'm, I'm part of the weakest clan in, our, in our, divi our tribe. I'm one of the poorest members there. How can I send? How can I go and rescue Israel? And the Lord's, Lord's response is, well, I'm sending you. So Gideon says, here's my anti-resume, and the Lord says, I'm sending you. O mighty man of valor, hiding out here, do I not send you? And of course, this account ends with Gideon seeing the Lord. There's a scene at the very end where this fire consumes this meal that Gideon set on the stone. The angel of the Lord disappears, and Gideon has this response. He, for a moment, he sees, alas, Lord God, I've seen the Lord face to face. And of course, we, we look forward to some sort of encounter with the Lord this morning through his word, don't we? So let's stop. Let's pray together as we consider this text. Father, we who have gathered here today, we know that you've said to us, come to me, you who are weak. And you have said to us, I am sending you. And we have so much trouble seeing how to connect those dots you've called us the weak ones, and you've sent us the weak ones, but we know it's your presence and your grace that connects the dots. It comforts us, your presence, you teach us, and in your presence you send us. So be gracious to us this morning as we open your word and as we gather at your table. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So when the Lord comes to Gideon, Gideon asks, asks him, a, I think, a decent question. He asks him, where have you been? Right. So the, the Midianites and the Amalekites, these tribes that are still around us, the Midianites in particular, 
Um, you know, there, there are these people that remained in the land. The, when Joshua led the Israelites into the land, they, there was a conquest, but the conquest was somewhat incomplete. And so now you have this version where the Midianites are not necessarily dominating uh, these Israelites uh, you know, with military power or political control, but really you've got this scene where uh, it's economic exploitation. The Midianites come in as locusts and they plunder the crops, leaving nothing to spare for the Israelites, forcing the Israelites to leave their homes and to go find hidden homes in, in, a, in a cave somewhere. And of course, it kind of makes sense that Gideon, because of all this, is threshing out wheat in a wine press. Uh, threshing wheat would normally be done in a higher place. You know, you sort of you toss it up and it separates the wheat from the chaff and the wind blows the chaff away. Uh, but a wine press is, is somewhat underground. It's, it's, a, it's a low place. And so it doesn't make any sense wheat-wise to thresh wheat in a low place like a wine press, but it makes a lot of sense if you're hiding out, right, uh, from these enemies. And the Lord comes to him and says, he says to Gideon, the Lord is with you. And Gideon says, really? Where have you been? I know the story of the great rescue from, the, from Egypt. Lord, it seems like you've forsaken us to the Midianites. How can this happen to you? How can this happen to us? Uh, and so this, this answer, this where have you been, this is actually a question that's in the background of the whole book of Judges. It's actually an answer that God gives that's given throughout the whole book of Judges because the Lord really doesn't answer Gideon's question directly here. Uh, he just, Gideon says, where have you been? And the Lord says, I'm sending you, <laughs> you know? Uh, but we do see that answer already given other, other places in the book of Judges. So if you have a Bible... Uh, if you want to use the Pew Bible, grab it. The Pew Bible, this, this will be page uh, 234. Uh, Judges chapter 2, verses 11 through 19. So if, as Gideon asks, where have you been? Well, let, let's talk about where the Lord has been and what's going on in the story. And of course, then we'll look at uh, Judges 6, 1 through 11. And on the screen here for you, as we consider both of these texts, on the screen here for you, uh, you'll see what's been going on in this whole book of Judges. There's sort of this Judges cycle where the people sin, uh, they're oppressed, the people cry out to God in pain, God sends a rescuer, and that issues in a time of peace, the peace only lasts a short amount of time, and then the people repeat the same process all over, all over and over again. And that's what I'll read to you from Judges chapter 2, verses 11 through 19. This is wor working us through this cycle that's happening here. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods among the gods of the people who were around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and gave them over to plunderers who plundered them and sold them into the hands of their surrounding enemies, so they can no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them. And that, that idea of judges there, the Lord raised up judges, it's not like you know, someone who sits like as you know, evaluating talent on like a America's Got Talent or something like that, and it's not like someone who wears a, a black robe and decides court cases. No, the idea of the Lord sending judges, that's like a rescuer. Uh, it's like a prophet that he sends as well. A judge would also be something like a ruler. So think about that. So, and so the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways." So thinking about this time, this I'll give you a little time stamp. This is the time between uh, Israel's conquest of the land under Joshua and then the later time where Israel would have a king ruling over them. And so it's actually a time where the conquest of the land was somewhat incomplete. Uh, we find the Israelites at the beginning of the book of Judges coexisting with the Canaanites instead of, instead of what they were meant to do, drive them out completely. Uh, they were meant to confound and confront 
all the Canaanites and, and the gods of the Canaanites, but instead they, they coexisted. And that's a big deal to coexist side by side with these Canaanites because of their, we're told over and over again, their worship of false gods, their worship of idols, and all the corrupt behavior that comes with the worship of false gods and idols. Uh, so in the Canaanites, you have this destructive sexual behavior. You have injustice. You have harmful ritual worship, including body mutilation. Uh, you have these uh, you know, widespread and detestable practices of child sacrifice, which even crept its way into, the, into Israel. Uh, you have violence and abuse in these communities among the most vulnerable among them. And so, so they've, they've adopted those practices and, as they coexist with them. And so you kind of see that. They turned aside from the Lord. They forsook the Lord and chased after the gods of the Canaanites and everything that came with them. But we're told in this whole judges scene that God would send a rescuer. God would send a judge, one who would fight for his people, who would lead them uh, out of a time of distress and oppression into a time of peace for a time. And what's interesting, if you were to give some time studying through the book of Judges, is you'll notice that this cycle that's happening as it, the story is told over and over again is actually not just a cycle, but it's a, a downward spiral as well. The longer the book goes, the times of peace get thinner and thinner, the, the corruption gets worse and worse each time, uh, and even the judges themselves, as you go along the story, the judges themselves are less and less admirable. You get all the way to Jephthah later on in the book, and Jephthah apparently is unfamiliar with the character of God because he's willing to keep some sort of oath where he might sacrifice his daughter. He's unfamiliar with the character of God. You get to Samson. Samson seemingly has no spiritual commitments and complete disregard for the holy. And so you see even the judges themselves trending down. And so, and, and so Gideon says, Lord, where have you been? The Lord says, where have you been? <laughs> You know, you've forsaken me. We can, look at, we can look at Judges chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, kind of right before this scene with Gideon, and we can get a little bit more uh, specifics here. What we find is that before God sends a rescuer or a savior, God says, I've sent a prophet to you. And this is what, this is, this is what happens. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on the account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the hand of bondage, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you, and I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So before God sends a rescuer, he sends a sermon. And the people need to understand, this is why you're in the predicament that you're in. And your problem and your oppression is not primarily social, it's not primarily economic or military, but it's idolatry. The Lord says, this is the predictable and certain emptiness that, that, uh, and ruin that comes with the worship of idols. You've chased after the gods of the Canaanites, the gods that have promised you allure, fertility, or power, or security, and he says, the irony, is, the irony is, is as you've chased after the gods of the Canaanites, the Canaanites, these nations are the very ones who have turned back on you to take away from you life and security and prosperity and peace. Those are the tribes turning back on you. And so it goes with any idol. We talk about idolatry a lot. Anything we put our trust in, which is not God, is an idol. And anything we put our trust in that's not God cannot bear the weight of being God. There's a wonderful episode of I Love Lucy. I think they're probably all wonderful. Um, and the OGs will remember this one. But there's a scene, there's an episode where uh, Lucy and Ethel are hired to work in a, in a chocolate factory. Let's just, let's just pause. Who has seen I Love Lucy? Okay, more gray hair than not. Uh, who has never seen I Love Lucy? You know what? Their knees don't hurt when they bend. You know, that's, that's what's happening. So... Um, so Lucy and Ethel are hired to work in a chocolate factory. They're wrapping up chocolates that come down this conveyor belt. And at first they say, this is not so bad. You know, so the, the, the boss lady comes in at first and says, let her roll. You know, and so the chocolates come down this conveyor belt. And they're just meant to wrap them and put them back on the conveyor belt. But it, the, the movement is constant and steady and it seems to be ever quickening. You know, eventually you find Lucy and, and Ethel. They're, you know, pulling the chocolates off the conveyor belt. They're stuffing them inside their blouses or inside their mouth. And, of course, they stop for a second, and the, the supervisor comes in again and says, Whoa, y'all are doing a great job. It looks like everything's fine here. 
And what does she say? Speed it up a little. And of course, they just, the chocolates start rolling down the conveyor belt. There's something to that, right? Like, Lucy and Ethel are, are faking it. There's something about the breakneck demands of any idol we give ourselves to. We feel like we cannot get out. And there's got to be within us this humility to stop. And we always say even just this ability to stop and to repent. When we think about idolatry for ourselves now, we ask these questions. How do, how do we find our idols? Well, we say, what consumes our thoughts and our solitude? What causes deep anger and despair when we don't get what we want? What are the patterns of how we spend our money? What gets us out of bed in the money when we have it, out of the bed in the morning when we have it? And what makes us feel like life isn't worth living when we don't? Now, of course, in our time, there's this idolatrous trinity of pleasure and money and power. These are the highest goods of our culture, and the multiplication of those goods are said to be our highest good. That's the idolatrous trinity of our time. But will each one of those allure or pleasure or power or money, will any of those actually deliver us? Or will one day, like the chocolates on the conveyor belt, will they just turn on us, cause all kinds of trouble for us? Famous words from David Foster Wallace, he said this, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million different deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid. And you will never, ever, uh, you, will, you will need ever more power over those to keep that fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. And in the book of Judges, the Lord is trying to lead his people out of that idolatry and into repentance. And the book gives us this distinction because you see in that cycle that oftentimes the people see their oppression, they see what these idols have caused, and they will cry out to the Lord in pain. But really the Lord in the whole book is trying to move his people from just regret and crying out in pain to actually true repentance. And we think about that even for ourselves today. What is the difference between crying out to the Lord in regret and actual repentance? Well, regret can be sorrow and deep distress over the consequences of our sins. We're disgusted with the consequences of our sins. So we cry out to the Lord, relieve me of these things. Sometimes the Bible calls that worldly sorrow, not the sorrow that leads to repentance. It's oftentimes something we have to explain to our children in our home. You are sorry right now because of the consequences of what you did. You are not really sorry about what you did. And that needs to be told to us adults very often too, doesn't it? But repentance, by contrast, is a kind of sorrow over the sin itself. Repentance, by contrast, is relational. It's not that I've broken a rule and now I'm hurt by it, hurt by it but I've broken a heart, and that hurts me. Repentance is... Um, a repentant person actually can be consoled by the mercy of God, too. And this is so important. In fact, if you're trying to figure out if you're actually just, uh, you know, regretful or repentant, your repentance, you can be consoled by the mercy of God. There will be relief in repentance. If you cannot be consoled by God and his forgiveness, that probably exposes that there's some sort of idolatry that you're still clinging to. If you say, I cannot forgive myself for what I've done to my friend, or I cannot forgive myself for what I've done to my family, or our finances, or I can't forgive myself for what I've done and ruined my career, and I cannot forgive myself because of what I've done to ruin my reputation or this previous perfect life, well, it, it probably tells you that you're still worshiping comfort or security or approval or control. And the important thing we need to think about here is when we walk into a season of repentance, we don't just need to repent about the thing that we've done. We also need to think long and hard about repenting of, from the idolatry beneath it. So often we think, okay, I'm gonna, I, my, my blow-ups in anger are about are just here. Let me, I'm sorry for blowing up in anger, but really maybe it's because we worship control. We need to repent our way out of that control. Maybe we worship comfort. We need to repent our way out of that comfort. We have to look beneath the surface. Now, do the people do this? Does God wait for the people to repent in this way? The Lord calls for repentance, but there's none of it. You get straight from verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 10, but you have not obeyed my voice, straight to chapter 6, verse 11, and the angel of the Lord came to Gideon. The Lord's not waiting. 
There's no inclination of heartfelt repentance. There's no burning of idols that happens first. There's no uprooting of, of destructive ways that even happens. The Lord, in the very next verse, commissions a rescuer. And the whole book of Judges is showing us this tension of who God is and how he relates to us, that God is holy. He demands obedience because he is holy. And God is also a God of grace. He, God has made these promises. God has sworn a loyalty to a covenant that he's made with Abraham. God is committed to finishing the story. So God in the book of Judges is saying, is saying I've covenanted with you, and I've covenanted with, um, but you've covenanted with gods of the other nations. God says, I've sworn to bless you, but you've, I've not sworn to bless a rebellious people. God says, I'm committed to my faithfulness to you, but I'm also committed to my holiness. And there's a big theological question happening among the pages of Scripture here. Is how can God be both? How can God be holy enough and gracious enough at the same time as he says he is? And what we find here is that the Lord does not wait for his people to repent before his saving initiative. Of course, we know this because we've read Romans chapter 5, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our repentance doesn't kickstart God's deliverance. Of course, we do repent when we encounter this God in his holiness and in his compassion. But our, our goodness doesn't kickstart his deliverance. In fact, if you, if you think about it, his great deliverance kickstarts new hearts within us. So we think about this phrase, I, I like this, the gospel according to judges. Odd place to find the gospel it's this, despite unfaithfulness, God sends a savior. So he sends Gideon, and Gideon is a, is a weak warrior. Uh, if God's going to call somebody, he's certainly calling a, a, a weak person. Gideon gives his list of disqualifications. He implies that God should send an Exodus-style rescuer like Moses, who could just or God could just take care of this himself without involving uh, people like him. And the Lord's answer to him is so simple. Have I not sent you? I'm with you. Isn't it interesting? Like, this is sort of a lesson all throughout the pages of Scripture. God, why aren't you helping? And God says, why don't you join me? Why don't you, I'm commissioning you to help me handle this problem. And the way this Gideon story begins is that Gideon is totally unaware of God's presence and only aware of his limitations. And as the story goes on and where it ends is Gideon is now aware of God, and he's still working on himself. And I kind of like the honesty of that. Like, so you, you thought I was going to say something else. Like, he's totally unaware of God, and he's totally unaware of God, but only aware of his limitations. And then, I would say, and then we, we think, you would think, we'd say, Gideon is now aware of God, and there are no limitations. But no, Gideon is now aware of God, and he's really working, <laughs> which is where we are, isn't it? Isn't that where we are? Aware of God, but we're working on some stuff. So Gideon bids this angel to stay, arranging for the Lord to give him a sign. Is it really you, God? So Gideon prepares this meal. It's these cakes and this meat and some broth, and he puts it, he wants to put it before the angel of the Lord, the Lord himself. We, we talked about that a little bit already. Is this really you? And the angel says, take the meat and the cakes and place it on a stone. Put the meal on a stone and pour the broth over it. Mm. And then the angel of the Lord reaches out with the tip of his staff and, um, and fire springs up from the stone and consumes the meal. And you get this picture. It's an offering. It's an offering now. This was, this was an altar. It's a sacrifice. And the angel of the Lord vanishes. And the moment is like an epiphany to Gideon. He knows who he's encountered. Alas, Lord God. But the first statement that comes after that is not a statement of profound gratitude. Not yet. It's not a statement of heart-melting wonder. Not yet. But the first statement after that is, from Gideon is fear. Wow, somehow I've seen the face of God. And we think, the face of God, that must be awesome. No, Gideon's sitting there wondering how his face did not get melted off, how he did not die. Gideon's in a panic, so dull. He's been so dull and so cynical and so weak and so wordy with the Lord. A man himself who has forsaken the Lord. He's got to go, his task first is to cut down, the, to get rid of the altar in his dad's backyard. The Old Testament warns us that no one can see the face of God and live. It's like getting too close to the sun. You'll burn up. But in all these theophanies we've been, we've been discovering, there's this moment 
of wonder and panting breath and this lingering question is, how can I see the face of the Lord and not die on the spot? Have you seen that pattern already? I've met with him. I've met with him face to face, and I deserve to be judged. Gideon knows. And the Lord speaks into that realization and says, peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. How can both of those be true? How can face-melting death holiness, how can that be a part of God and also him saying, peace be with you? How can God, with get presence with Gideon, be both a consuming fire that consumes a meal and a voice that says, peace, I am with you. My holiness is not here to cripple you, but make you strong. My grace is not here to excuse you and your behavior, but to purify you and make you holy. How can those both be true? How can this be the God that Gideon encounters? Have you thought about that? I don't think that answer is totally resolved in the book of Judges. It just continues on in this tension. And the answer actually comes into focus many years later. In Mark chapter 10, oddly enough, there's a time in which Jesus' disciples are concerned about their place of greatness and their power and their position. They're not really concerned about mission or calling or vocation, but instead concerned about a place of greatness. Not, not mission and weakness. Let's, let's sort out who's sitting next to you in the kingdom of heaven, God. And Jesus, is, the response of their king about being great in the kingdom, he said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am, being, which I am baptized? You think, what do those words mean? What is Jesus doing there? It, it means this, that Jesus saw the fulfilling of his mission as first drinking a cup. And the cup, it refers to as a metaphor for God's wrath in Scripture. God's wrath poured out in justice against all the evil that destroys. The cup of his wrath is his anger. It's his love and motion against that which destroys what he loves, against all evil. This cup of God's wrath, this is really what Gideon feared. And Jesus says, part of my mission is to drink that cup down to the very bottom. He says he'll be baptized with a baptism. What does that mean? Well, it means total immersion. Baptism is to go down into a certain kind of death. And so Jesus says that my mission, completing my mission on the cross will be a baptism. I will be completely consumed by this. You know what he's saying? I'm the meal sitting on the stone back in Judges chapter 6. I'm the one who will be struck by the staff of God. I'm the one who will be completely and utterly consumed in the sight of sinners deserving death so that the Lord God can, can declare peace to them. I am with you. My holiness is no, longer, is no longer here to kill you or cripple you, but to purify you. It's here to strengthen you. It's here to restore life to you in a way that life ought to be lived. The cross, this cup and this baptism is where grace and holiness truly meet. Justice and peace truly meet. The binding of worship and true freedom. It is purifying love that happens at the cross. So he says, my love, my love, don't you see, is the thing that transforms you and now binds you to me. So we have to think about Jesus, our Lord. He is not like the idols. The idols make demands with ever-diminishing returns. But the love of the Lord is the ultimate freedom, the ultimate fulfillment. I love these words from Tim Keller. In contrasting the Lord to every other idol, he says this, Jesus said this, Jesus is the only Lord who, if you receive him, will fulfill you completely, and if you fail him, will forgive you eternally. Your idols will never give you that satisfaction, that intimacy, that sense of life and freedom, because they demand and demand and demand, and we fear, lose them. we fear losing them. But Jesus says this to us so different. Listen to this. We fear losing our idols, don't we? Fear it. What if they go away? What if this goes away? What if it goes away? And Jesus is the only one who says, I've lost everything to say to you, I am with you. And the passage ends very simply. Gideon builds an altar, 
Gideon tears down an altar. It's what he should have been doing all along. But think about this. In, in fear and in weakness, is what we're, the very last of what we're told. He goes at night because he's still afraid. In fear and in weakness, Gideon goes. He took the assignment. You know, today we, we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And in a moment, we come together to the table of the Lord, and we share a meal. And we do this because on the night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, the, uh, the eve of his death on the cross, we do this meal because Jesus tells us to keep doing it. He took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he shared it with his disciples. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. And he took a cup of wine, and he said, this is my blood, blood of the new covenant. Blood of new covenant made with you. A commitment that the Lord will bring you through into his kingdom. My blood, I will keep the promise even if it kills me. And it did. He tells us to drink of the cup. He was totally consumed so that he can say with us, I am with you. And we meet him here at the Lord's table. Do you know that? Like the Lord has told us specifically, I'll give you a, a place and a time where I'll meet with you in a fresh way. We meet him here so we can say with Gideon, alas, Lord God, how can it be that you love me? But you have. How can it be that you're making me new? But you are. Alas, Lord God, how can it be that you're making me an instrument of your service and your love and your mission? But you are. We meet him here at the table again. We're going to ask our, our deacons to come forward and to take their place. We'll have some on each side of the sanctuary in the front, and we'll have deacons in our balcony space as well. I'll get them situated as they come forward and take their place, and I'll give you a few instructions as we go into this time. So if you're here on the bottom, as we take of this meal, I'll uh, say come to the center aisle. So if you're on the outside, come to the middle and circle around the back. If you're in the middle aisle, you can just pick a side, pick an aisle to go to, uh, and then circle around and go back to your seat. Uh, when you come forward, uh, one of our deacons will, uh, you'll take a piece of bread, and one of our deacons will say to you, this is the body of Christ, which is broken for you, and you'll take and eat. And you'll take the cup, and one of our deacons will say to you, this is the blood of Christ, which is shed for you. You'll take and drink, and so you'll observe this. If you're in the balcony, our deacons will be situated by the exit door on the piano side. Uh, you can think about the balcony going in quadrants, and that would be the kind of the traffic flow up there for you all. Uh, this morning, as we come to this table, uh, we recognize that this is a meal that Jesus Christ has left for his followers. This meal doesn't belong to a denomination. It doesn't belong to a church. It's Jesus' meal to give. But I would remind you that this meal is for the followers of Jesus. You wouldn't want to communicate anything by your actions today that, were not, that would not be true. So if that's not you this morning, if you're not a follower of Jesus, we invite you as we stand and receive this just to remain seated. It's a time for thought. It's a time for reflection. It's not a time to embarrass you. It's an opportunity for you to pray. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, if you don't know that holy, consuming love that delivers you, don't take the meal this morning. But I would plead with you, take Christ as your Savior today. And the next time we celebrate this meal, you can join in with us. So as we come forward, we're reminded that we come as repentant people, those who are seeking to walk in fellowship with God and with one another. But for all humble sinners who trust the Lord, uh, Jesus Christ, be assured that your sins and your vices should not keep you from this table. Jesus Christ welcomes all of his people who humbly come to find strength and healing in him. And so hear this invitation. Um, and after this invitation, you're invited to start. We'll start in the back. We have ushers back there. And we'll start back there and come forward. But here's the invitation to the Lord's table. Let all sinners who are grieved and humbled by their sin, let all the weak who need their faith to be strengthened, let all who love the triune God yet wish to love him more, come now to the table of the Lord. You're invited to come.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food. At your table where we celebrate your body and your blood. We ask you now to send us out into the world in peace. Grant us strength and courage to love and to serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. And we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we move forward, we reflect in a different way. Uh, Roger will come forward and our instrumentals will play um, for a moment. It's a time of offering where we think about uh, the space that we have in our service uh, to ask the question, what are we offering to the Lord today? Now, you may have come today prepared to, to give an offering in that way, a, a tithe, and so this may be a time you can prepare that. You can give that after the service is over behind you in the foyer or behind me outside these doors. But the bigger question is, uh, what have we previously held back from the Lord that we might offer to him? Uh, it might be to your imperfect talents, your limited resources, uh, your half-realized intentions, or your impaired efforts, but you give them to him for his good purposes. So we spend that time reflecting on that way, and just know that the Lord delights to turn our gifts into the riches of his grace. stand. Let's sing to I will thank you for gathering with us for worship this morning. Each week, we hope that your, your hearts and souls have been lifted with the good news of the gospel, and, and I trust that they were this morning as well. I just want to let you know about a few things that uh, you, can, you can see in your bulletin. Uh, as always, you're invited and encouraged to give as an act of worship. We, uh, we are so grateful uh, for the generosity of our church. Uh, and then if you do look in your bulletin, I'm going to try and go in, uh, in chronological order here. There's obviously a lot every week. Uh, but first thing is uh, Golden Circle is going to meet this Tuesday at 1030 uh, in the Fellowship Hall. So be sure to, to come and to gather for that for a uh, speaker and a covered dish. Uh, and then next Sunday, a couple of uh, things going on. Uh, it's Makeup Picture Day. And you know who you are. <laughs> I don't, but you do. And so if, uh, if you haven't gotten your uh, picture taken for our new uh, church directory. Be sure to, to do that. You can sign up using the uh, code that you can scan there 
uh, in your bulletin, or you can just show up. Uh, and we'll, we'll have both a digital and a print uh, version, uh, excuse me, version of that uh, directory. So again, if you haven't had your picture taken, again, you know who you are. Uh, be here next Sunday uh, dressed in a picture that you want immortalized in our uh, church directory. Uh, and then next Sunday evening at 5.30, uh, we'll have a contemporary worship praise night here in the sanctuary. So please come and, and gather with us for that. Uh, and then, uh, as you see as well, Fall Festival is coming up in two weeks. Is that two weeks from today? I think so. That's very soon. Uh, and, and Bailey knows that it's soon, yeah. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Uh, in, invite friends, invite neighbors to come to that. It's one of our main community outreach events. And so great opportunity to invite people that are maybe not connected with our church directly to, uh, to come and participate, and a great opportunity for you to come and serve as well. And so uh, it, it is not printed in the bulletin, but uh, this past week you would have received an email about our upcoming missions week. You've been hearing lots about that, so continue to uh, look for communications about that in the weeks ahead. Uh, that, is, that is also fast approaching the week immediately following our fall festival. So uh, the, the big date to maybe mark on your calendar for that is going to be Saturday, November the 2nd. That's when we're going to have an international dinner and an auction. Uh, I was making a list of all the auction items that we've had donated either from you or local businesses, and, and it's a lot. And so we really have an exciting opportunity to, to raise a lot of money for uh, the International Mission Board, uh, but also to fund some projects from... Uh, all of our missionaries, and I've, I've just heard back from the last uh, set, and so we've got projects that we want to try and fund for all of them, so please, please, please uh, save up your money, come ready to be, as I've termed it uh, Wednesday night, talking to the choir, shamelessly generous uh, that night, so uh, Saturday, November 2nd. Uh, there's other stuff in the bulletin, you can, uh, you can check that out as well, uh, but I just encourage you now, as we close the service, to stand, and I will read and, uh, and benedict us with the words of 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verses 23 to 24. They say this, and you can lift your hands if you'd like to to receive this benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Grace and peace. Thank you.